Today we talk about Fireside, the podcast, digital cash, and remote islands. The eyes may be able to see, but without a heart, you cannot fit. What's up everybody? This is George C. Samuels and you are tuning in to episode 64 of the It Will Come Show. Live streaming straight from my room because we are all practicing social distancing, self-isolation in this time of corona. And as mentioned, we'll be talking today about Fireside Podcast, our new podcast for our sponsoring company, Fire, and Digital Cash in relation to an interview that was had with the uh, infamous Craig Wright in the Bitcoin space and remote islands. So let's get started. So this right here is the page for our new podcast, Fireside. So if you are not familiar with Fire, uh, it is a uh, company or a collection of companies dedicated to helping to bridge the gap between people and technology, uh, specifically uh, communities, helping businesses and brands uh, build communities around their products um, or their services. And also on the technology side, we deal with any new emerging technology. Uh, right now, we're experts in Bitcoin SV, which is a blockchain, and this podcast here is literally about interviewing some of the best, the brightest, the most influential around how they are either involved or looking to leverage technology to bridge gaps between people and technology. So our first episode uh, is with the billionaire Calvin Ayer, who owns CoinGeek.com. Uh, if you haven't been there, I uh, highly recommend you check it out. Um, and, uh, and various other companies. He's also been a big supporter and backer of Bitcoin SV, um, also known by its ticker symbol BSV. And uh, here you'll hear a little bit from him about you know why he's involved um, and putting so much money towards that and why it's actually important for, uh, for blockchain, any, any blockchain to scale, um, especially with something called the Bitcoin halving uh, that, that's, that's popping up shortly. So yeah, do go and check out our podcast. It is at anchor.fm forward slash FireCorp. And with this, we hope you enjoy. Uh, it will be going out every Friday. Um, so that's, that's weekly and is hosted by uh, Adam Bauket. So with that, let's move on. Speaking of Bitcoin. So on April 1st, we interviewed Craig Wright as part of the Breakthrough Conference powered by Draper Startup House. And this was about an hour long interview, which was, it's always a pleasure interviewing Craig Wright. And if you're not familiar with who Craig Wright is, um, just go to the internet and Google Craig Wright. You'll find a lot of pieces, news articles that uh, may either slam him or praise him. So his, uh, known to be the outspoken creator of Bitcoin itself. Uh, for those of you who have heard about Bitcoin, you might have heard about the mysterious creator Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, but just imagine, you know, uh, you going onto the internet and using a pseudonym uh, or a moniker. And, you know, people then, of course, you know, praising that and uh, having a hard time uh, coming to terms with the fact that maybe the person behind that name uh, might not be a benevolent, or not benevolent, but might not be exactly what you thought they would be, all right? And it's very interesting because this is why it has uh, made me interested in this space because it, go it has shown me a lot about human behavior in general, what people gravitate towards, how people prote uh, project their, their ideas and beliefs onto other people and onto other things. Um, so it's a very fascinating story behind Craig Wright, Highly recommend you dig deep into his story. Um, whether you believe he is the creator of Bitcoin or not, it doesn't matter. But you can take a look at all the things that he's come out since uh, that he's that he's put out since he has come out. And uh, yeah, with that, uh, we spoke uh, about quite a few things from you know the coronavirus right now, his views on sort of the the economic fallout or issues that are certainly arising at this point in time, and. Here, there is actually a uh, one of our beautiful people on Twitter. Gotta love Twitter. 
uh, for better or for worse, but actually managed to timestamp the section where Craig Wright and I have our interview. So if you go to this article, which you can be can be found here, um, there will be a link to the tweet that goes straight to um, the interview within the conference, and you can have a have a view of that. Uh, I think one of the main things uh, that I took away was when Craig talks about how Bitcoin is is more digital cash than it is um, cryptocurrency, right? A, a, a digital currency uh, more than a cryptocurrency, and I, I think this is a, this is good positioning because cryptocurrencies as well uh, have uh, you know gotten a bad rap. I think people have sort of misconstrued what it's meant to be used for. People are looking at just how to use you know cryptocurrencies uh, for everything, tokenize everything. Not a bad thing, but um, there's just a lot of misconceptions and it's very fascinating to see how um, in the wider community you will see uh, these misconceptions be accepted as truths and it shapes how people see or perceive things as well, right? Because because of that underlying belief, uh, everything else factually uh, is used to support the underlying belief. And you could probably apply this to, to anything really uh, in life. Whatever your whatever your primary belief system is, that'll dictate what sort of facts you use to support that, you know, how you view things. So we often think about how do we actually take different perspectives, um, different angles of uh, anything that we're looking at because we all have our biases. And so, yeah, with that, um, a really useful article. Um, hopefully you enjoy uh, the interview itself. And you know, while we're, we're looking at the sort of topic of uh, digital cash, um, actually, let me see if I can bring uh, this up. Ah, yes, here we go. So before we go and talk about remote islands, uh, speaking of remote islands, well, actually, I'll bring this up after this. Okay, okay. So in this article um, sent to me, uh, Earlier, o over the last 24 hours, uh, so thanks um, to the person who did send that to me. And this article just talks about sort of where would you re where would you want to be at this point in time uh, during a, a pandemic, mm -hmm. right? And there are of course quite a few remote islands that uh, are on that list. So you can see here the 19 countries without COVID-19 right now. Comoros, Kiribati, Lesotho, Malawi, Marshall Islands, Micronesia, Nauru, North Korea, Palau, Samoa. Although North Korea, we might just not hear anything, right? So not sure about that. Solomon Islands, South Sudan, Tonga, Tuvalu. Now I've highlighted Samoa and Tuvalu because um, that's actually par part of my heritage from uh, my mother's side. So Samoan, uh, Tuvalu and Samoan. And so it's cool to see these two islands there. Um, so, you know, to all my family and relatives that are back on the islands, good job. Uh, don't have to worry about COVID-19 for now. Um, and it just goes to show also sort of the uh, the benefits of being remote during times like this, right? And and this is what always makes me come back to the principles of yin and yang. Um, in, it, it's, yes, it's great to be connected and hyper-connected in our world. But in a time like this, actually, that has become sort of like our downfall, right? Because we're so connected, it has, been, it has made it a lot easier for coronavirus to spread everywhere. Um, and of course, if you are this remote island, you're disconnected from everything, you're actually quite safe. So with that, now that uh, you know about Tuvalu, and if you actually haven't heard of some of these islands, many of them are actually from the South Pacific. So Samoa and Tuvalu, uh, if you know where Australia and New Zealand is, and Hawaii, uh, Samoa and Tuvalu are about in the middle of that. Very, very small islands. So I brought up this article because it was actually something I, I, I wrote as sort of a plea to the Tuvaluan government uh, around New Year's Eve. All right, so this was just four months ago. Can you believe we're in April? Four months ago, and uh, the reason I wrote it was because I, I got news that uh, Tuvalu is going to be um, re-signing their deal for .TV. So if you didn't know this little factoid, uh, Tuvalu is actually the, the, the nation that has rights to .TV. Um, how other companies are able to use it is that they um, essentially um, pay Tuvalu for the rights to resell that. And so every, every time you see something like .TV, uh, a lot of that has, uh, you know, there was a, a deal arranged with Tuvalu. Now, the, the issue I had was that the deal that Tuvalu had organized, um, I think it was with Verizon, 
uh, at the time wasn't really the best deal because they didn't really know what the value was at the time. They really didn't understand um, much about the internet in general. And so in my opinion, I think they got a pretty, uh, pretty shitty deal. And with that, I put a proposal about how they can potentially renegotiate things uh, coming up in 2021 around .tv and how they can position themselves a little bit better. And uh, unsurprisingly, I included uh, Bitcoin, right? And when I, when I refer to Bitcoin, I'm talking about BSV, okay? And so let's have a look at the actual plan, right? The plan here is to open .tv to a bidding war. So this is uh, to get, I believe they're going to, you know, they have a good relationship with Verizon, but uh, they, I think they should actually open, uh, open it up, right? So that other companies who are interested, uh, you can get a bidding war uh, happening, and then you can actually get a, a better sense of the true price uh, or the true value, right, as a result of that. Uh, they could then run a nationwide digital transformation program, right, from the money that they negotiate or the deal that they negotiate with uh, whoever they decide to take on for to, to give the uh, reselling rights of .tv to, um, then use that money productively. Because one thing I found out about Tuvalu, which was really interesting, is that they actually have a very high literacy rate, a very educated population. But many of them think that they need to go overseas in order to get work. In my opinion, I don't think they do. Um, they could actually leverage a lot of the uh, educated population, um, teach them how to use uh, the web, the internet, um, if they don't know already, uh, but more productively, right? How to make money online, etc. If you look at companies like the Philippines, um, even Singapore, or even any sort of outsourcing hub, right? Uh, a lot of a, a lot of uh, external foreign companies would outsource, you know, for them cheaply, but it would still be worth quite a lot for people locally. And so I, I think they should definitely look at running a digital transformation program there. Uh, then uh, using that same money, improve the internet infrastructure, right? So while this, while the digital transformation programs are um, being created and, and organized, then look at improving the inf internet infrastructure. Uh, go cashless. Tuvalu is small enough that it can go cashless, in my opinion. And that is where sort of Bitcoin comes in. And then five, to invest in land and property, right? Using the money that they can get uh, either uh, by using Bitcoin or um, improve the internet infrastructure and, and, and the money that's coming in from the renegotiated deal. Invest in land and property elsewhere because Tuvalu is also at the forefront of climate change in the sense of rising ocean levels. So if uh, ocean levels continue to rise, they'll be one of the first islands to sink. And so with that, uh, I think having a good backup plan, like you know another, another island or just something elsewhere would just be very useful for them at this point in time. And because we are now currently going through um, a recession and a possible depression, I think by investing in land and property elsewhere, they're going to get um, a huge you know, bargain off of a lot of that in, in overseas. And uh, a lot of that money, either they can choose to rent it out, get even more money back for the country. Um, I, I think that's just a way that they can turn themselves from a small little island um, that uh, you know, might be needing to ask other countries for for help assistance donation to make them a lot more uh, self-sufficient right uh, and because I'm a huge proponent of people hmm, not always asking for handouts you know um, but to make themselves self-sufficient to build them up make them strong uh, and and probably influenced by the fact of why I, I moved to Singapore um, is because Singapore has a very similar story they, they try to rejoin with Malaysia uh, got kicked out and then uh, Eventually, they said, well, if we don't have anyone to turn to, you know, let's look at our strengths, what we have, and um, double down on that, you know, and just 50 years later, look at where Singapore got itself to. So I think there's a, a lot that can be learned from small island nations who actually became huge economic superpowerhouses um, in the long run. So with that, <laughs> uh, speaking of remote islands and, and, and oceans, this was a very interesting article. Billionaire David Geffen, I don't know if I'm saying that right, uh, deleted his Instagram after being slammed for a post about how he's self-isolating on his $590 million super yacht. Super yacht, mm-hmm. And look, I ain't got anything against that, um, to be honest. You know, everybody's, everybody's sort of coming from different parts of society, life, and so, you know, good on him if he's got that yacht. Um, but I can see how a lot of other people would have an issue with this and think that it's insensitive, etc. But, you know, again, in my opinion, it's not a time uh, to worry about such frivolous things, in my opinion, man. Like, 
you know, go out and help people, connect with your friends and family. Like, don't worry about what these billionaires are doing. Um, anyways, that's, that's my opinion. Uh, of course, conspiracy theorists uh, may actually be saying things like, actually, you should be worrying about what the billionaires are doing. But it is what it is. Uh, so yeah, this you know this was interesting. Sadly, the guy you know deletes his uh, Instagram because he got slammed by other people. Um, shouldn't care, uh, but I understand people with power, influence, leaders like, need to be role models. But at the same time, I think we have a responsibility as consumers, users, etc., um, to what's the word to uh, manage our own reactions. Right, that's what you have control over because there's going to be so many things that might trigger you in life and. You just waste a lot of time if you're being constantly triggered by stuff, you know. Control your own reactions, your emotions, as much as possible. But I think we should also, at the same time, still be mindful. Um, yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, speaking of billions, so here we have WeWork founder. Now, if, if you're not familiar with this story or if you haven't heard of WeWork, WeWork is a chain of co-working spaces that made the headlines, I think it was last year, for one of the biggest like, payouts um, for a CEO when the company was really making no money whatsoever. And so the, the kerfuffle here essentially was SoftBank had agreed to pay like several billion dollars out to the CEO um, on, uh, on certain conditions. And it looks like those conditions now have not been met. So as a result, uh, the CEO of WeWork, or ex-CEO, um, doesn't get the billion dollars, which I think is great because this was truly, truly reckless in my opinion. Um, and it's, it's, sort of a, it's sort of a reflection on the Silicon Valley culture, um, which you know, they're going to struggle with now, uh, in my opinion. But in the past, right, the, the Silicon Valley sort of way of growing and expanding was to just pump a lot of money into something, uh, go hard, expand very quickly, and then figure things out later, right? Uh, that could be, um, I mean, th that was fine once upon a time, but now, I don't know. You know, it's, it's, it's definitely something that I don't think will, will work in this new world that we're entering into. I think what we're going to see now is we're going to see investors smarten up a bit again and go back to business fundamentals, uh, go back to businesses that can actually make a profit, um, and you know, and, and take things a bit slower, right? Because it's it's reminding us again the importance of slowing down, and and that's why we we have been giving time in general. Um, I think that definitely there are times where you need to go faster, but if you're looking to build something that lasts, uh, I think it's important to have patience um, and be able to slow down so you can think some things through a little bit better um, you know startup culture often times is you know uh, ship fast or build fast and break things right and yeah I think now it's gonna be um, build slow and repair things right because that's really where we are at at this point in time we need to slow down we're being forced to slow down uh, with coronavirus we're being forced to rest um, and I don't see that that is a bad thing, right? I know economically, and you know, referring back to my talk with Craig Wright previously, I don't think that, um, yeah, like the economically, it's going to hurt for us. But it, we have to also take responsibility for poor choices in the past. This is a result of us thinking that we could just go hard um, uh, without rest, without stopping, and that there wouldn't be consequences. You know, I again always refer back to yin and yang. If you're going to go hard. 80-20 rule, Pareto principle, if you're familiar with that, just take that time, you know, um, it's like, so it's like go hard, sprint, but then have a rest um, at some point in time. And I think the earth is just being constantly going without any rest. And, you know, eventually, you know, people will blame China and the bats and everything for coronavirus. But I think that it's much bigger than that. I think that was just a catalyst, you know, it wasn't the root cause. The root cause is ourselves. Uh, we had an overpopulation issue. We were continuing to, you know, rape the earth. Um, you know, to put it bluntly, and we were just not thinking about uh, much about what we were doing as we were doing it. And I think now we're being forced to evaluate that, look at it, and I hope we do things differently. And so, yeah, with that, you know, we work. Hmm, I'm not too sad for them, but I do see a lot of co-working spaces are going to be suffering during this time. Um, but you know, so is uh, so are many other businesses. And I think those who will come out of this unscathed are those who are able to innovate and adapt um, as quickly as possible, right? 
And then last but not least, I'm going to leave you with this, uh, this, this tweet. Uh, it's a hilarious, right? So we talked about Zoom the other day in one of our episodes. And uh, well, if, are you familiar with this painting, right? It's the Last Supper. You see Jesus there? What's missing? <laughs> All right. There's supposed to be some people on the side. Well, have a look at this. This is what the Last Supper would look like with, uh, with Zoom <laughs> today. So uh, yeah, I, I hope that um, brings a little humor and light to your day. Uh, all things considered. And with that, with that, we've got, boom, boom, boom. as always, remember, through patience and persistence, it will come, and we shall see you in our next episode. The eyes may be able to see, but without a heart.